environmental lawyers here who have their hands on the pulse of progressive changes that are happening in, in the environmental law sphere. You may think, we're looking at you guys, we may think you guys have failed so far, because when we look at the skies, but there is some potential, and I'm not holding you responsible, even though, you know, Zhang Jingjing, you know, you are one of the leading public interest lawyers in China, you work for Center for Legal Assistance on Pollution Victims, you've brought, you brought the very first super big uh, lawsuit, you know, what was Objection. it? Yeah, against a chemical company, you haven't fixed it yet, Jing Jing. <laughs> but there's potential. Um, but Jay, Jay Monteverde, he's a program manager at AVA's Beijing office, where besides focusing on environment, you also look at other, other sticky issues in China as well, um, like disability and labor law. But environment's your main portfolio, I believe. And also, you've done a lot of work on public interest law in the past under the Pill Network. Yeah. And in the U.S., I was a, I would practice law as well for five years. And you're a Midwesterner like me, I think. Yes. Chicago. Grew up in Chicago. I'm Chicago area too. So okay. this is <laughs> Midwesterners are taking over today's panel. And even though he's not from the Midwest, Steve Wilson is. I am. I am. From you are? Detroit. Oh, he yes. Is, yeah, it's a different Midwest, but okay. Yeah, no, you're no, you're Midwest. I know something about industrial restructuring, <laughs> and economic transformation. So um, he's a senior attorney at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency Office of General Counsel where he coordinates a lot of the international capacity building activities on environmental law. He's done trainings all over the world, but I think he's got kind of a soft spot for China. Been doing a lot of work there. And so with these three environmental lawyers, they're going to take us on a kind of a tour of some hopefully positive trends, mind the gaps, what could happen and be better in governance. Did I kind of specifically vaguely summarize what you guys are going to do? Because there's a lot of changes. Not stealing your thunder. And also, just for the record, the first presentation, no PowerPoint. It's a new trend we're experimenting with at the China Farm <laughs> Forum. It's old-fashioned conversation. Now, your job, ladies and gentlemen, more of you have come in the room, I'm glad, um, is that you're going to have to think of difficult questions because this crew can handle it. And so they're going to give us succinct presentations between 15 and 20 minutes-ish. And um, you guys ready? All right. Steve, it's all yours. OK. Thanks so much, Jennifer, and thanks for uh, organizing this event. I think uh, it's so important to pull folks together here at the uh, China Environment Forum to talk about environmental law in China, because I think there's some really interesting things happening uh, there that could really make a difference going forward. Um, Jennifer mentioned the work that I do at EPA. We have a, a, a program working with China. Uh, on environmental cooperation, and uh, I lead the part of that that's focused on environmental law. Um, I got involved working with China back in 2007 when the Strategic Economic Dialogue was launched, uh, and it led to a deepening and also broadening of U.S.-China cooperative uh, engagements. And that trend has only continued in the current administration. Um, but in terms of the EPA involvement, there are, of course, different parts of EPA involved. The Air Office leads work on air, the Water Office on water, the Enforcement Office on enforcement, et cetera. Um, but we've also found that there's a lot of overlap between the issues, and we try to work together uh, as much as we can to find sort of uh, opportunities for synergies in that work. Uh, so for example, some of what I'll say about air pollution control. Uh, is informed by collaboration with EPA's Air Office. And then we also work with folks uh, uh, outside of EPA, uh, including folks here at the, at the table. Um, uh, uh, so uh, we, we try to uh, work with folks uh, who are on the ground in China as much as possible, since we don't have a local, a local presence there. Um, so I think you know, folks here know uh, that, that China's people uh, have become increasingly assertive in voicing their concerns about pollution. Um, and I would take it a, a step further and say that this anti-pollution sentiment has really hit home with, uh, with the public and with the government and is now sparking a wave of environmental law reform. Um, and just uh, last week, a report came out from the uh, uh, Academy of Environmental Planning in China noting the huge gap uh, they called it, between how fast the environment is being improved and how fast the public is demanding it to be improved. Um, and so, of course, it's the, it's the, uh, the action that's lagging behind 
or the improvement that's lagging behind the demand, uh, and that this could easily uh, become a tipping point that leads to social risks. Um, so there's sort of a very practical concern for the Chinese leaders. But I also think that the, the, lead, the Chinese leaders, at, at least in the environmental uh, mi environment ministry, um, are, and, and more and more in other parts of the government, are aware of the magnitude of the impact uh, of pollution in China. You have a lot of discussion about the health impacts of PM 2.5 and other pollutants. You have the work that the World Bank has done uh, on the economic impacts, the work the World Health Organization has done uh, on the global burden of disease and over, over a million premature deaths a year, they say, from air pollution in China. And all of that information is, is hitting home, as well as the sort of uh, concern about social risk. So there's two questions from my viewpoint. Um, one is, uh, are we correct in perceiving that there is really a wave of environmental reform going on in China? and that, that reform, those reforms are significant. And uh, part of the issue of the significance, I think, goes to how, how best should we understand the linkages of environmental reforms in China and other things that are happening in China, economic restructuring, legal system reform, anti-corruption campaign, political consolidation, all of those trends. Uh, I'll focus mostly on the, the link to legal system reform today. Um, and that's in part because my last trip to China was in January, uh, and it illustrates how some of these bilateral engagements uh, can combine focusing on environmental protection with focusing on improving governance. Uh, the Commerce Department actually organized our trip. They organize uh, with MOFCOM, the U.S. Commerce Department and MOFCOM, organize an annual U.S.-China legal exchange. And the purpose is to engage, uh, for the U.S. Uh, lawyers to engage the Chinese legal community and to help advance the rule of law. Um, and this year, they spent a good chunk of the time at this uh, meeting discussing legal tools for controlling air pollution. Uh, and, you know, we, we consistently heard the themes both in this meeting and in our other meetings with uh, MEP and others, the, about the urgent need for China to tackle its pressing uh, pollution problems and the need for further development uh, of environmental laws to help do that. Um, and a strong interest, and, and not just the laws on the page, but also uh, implementation mechanisms and enforcement. Uh, and, you know, there's a great interest in learning from uh, the U.S. about uh, using legal means to reduce, using legal instruments to reduce pollution. Uh, but it's not just the U.S., of course. Uh, and we, we saw while we were over there that the EU has a very substantial presence with, I think, 15 uh, programs, uh, local programs around China uh, under their environmental governance project. Um, so one thing that we keep in mind when we're having these discussions is that uh, sort of from the uh, comparative law uh, literature, uh, that direct transplantation of legal tools across legal systems doesn't necessarily work uh, and often uh, encounters problems. Uh, and that's not just in China, but looking around the world. So there's a need, I think, for those of us who are in that sort of uh, knowledge sharing or capacity building community to better understand how legal tools can be adapted to the context. Uh, and that is one of the benefits that we gain from working with, uh, with other folks uh, outside our agency who are more familiar with the Chinese context and what's happening there. Uh, we also uh, met with the, uh, the legal department of the Environment Ministry uh, while we were in Beijing, and that's always kind of a centerpiece of our uh, interactions with China. Um, so the overall trend I see is one of environmental law reform momentum. Um, and uh, the folks uh, up here with me will talk some in particular about trends on transparency and the, and the new provision in the Environmental Protection Framework Law on public interest litigation. Um, and I think those are very important. Uh, and we just mentioned a couple of other aspects of that law that, um, that bear watching. Well, there's also a provision in the revised framework law 
for stricter penalties for violations. And there are also stronger provisions for holding government officials responsible for achieving environmental targets, including uh, one that I think is very interesting that would uh, provide for suspension of approvals of new pollution sources in areas that are failing to meet targets. Uh, and I understand that there are already some jurisdictions that uh, are doing that. Um, very important in our system in the U.S. as a mechanism for ensuring that not just the individual official, but sort of the power structure behind that official has the incentive to uh, achieve the targets because uh, they're not going to get any new sources uh, approved until, until they're at least on a path towards meeting the target. Uh, and then there's also the work being done to amend the air law. And I think that's another significant part of this wave. Um, and uh, building on the Clean Air Action Plan and other recent steps. Um, and what we're seeing there is improvements in monitoring and disclosure, uh, more provisions on holding government officials accountable for achieving targets, uh, uh, more provisions on increasing enforcement penalties, closing inefficient uh, factories that, that are highly polluting, uh, coal consumption limits in key regions, uh, doubling wind power, tripling solar, uh, and uh, moving towards a national framework for emissions trading. So I think, you know, we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of uh, good trends there. Um, another sort of example of a good trend is the uh, uh, air monitoring diplomacy. This is uh, the term that EPA Administrator Gina McCarthy uses uh, to talk about... Uh, just naughtiness. <laughs> <laughs> to talk about the uh, work the EPA Air Office uh, did working closely with the State Department to install air monitors on the roof of the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. And then to help them post air quality information online in a way that would be understandable for non-scientists. And so you have this, uh, this cell phone uh, app, uh, well, 137, not too bad today uh, in uh, Beijing. This is PM 2.5. Uh, Unhealthy for sensitive groups. Right. But they're right. sleeping now. So it's right. Um, it was uh, something over, well over 300, I think, uh, on Friday uh, when I checked. Um, but not, not to make light of it. I mean, this is, this is a serious issue. So having this information out there is useful. Um, of course, the Chinese public learned about this. I mean, the, the point of this for the embassy was to inform the diplomats so that they would know when air pollution reached dangerous levels, and then they and their families could take precautions. So if you're a runner, you might not go running outside uh, if the number is over 300. Uh, you might skip that day, or you might find an inside track. But the Chinese public learned about the readings, and this contributed to what was already a growing sense of concern about air pollution. So at first, there was some um, reticence, to put it mildly, uh, about this among the, the, the Chinese government officials, I think particularly the Beijing officials. Um, but over time, they came to realize that they, this was really an opportunity to tackle a serious liability if they could get in front of the problem. And so now, they have an extensive air monitoring system in Beijing uh, and in dozens of other cities. Um, and are also developing these uh, ambitious programs to cut pollution. So, uh, so overall, we see kind of a real positive in this. And in fact, just uh, recently, Secretary of State Kerry and EPA Administrator McCarthy announced that they're going to build on this example uh, of the power of information and expand air monitoring diplomacy into other countries. Um, so how does this relate to uh, governance reform? Because I think that's really a central uh, issue with respect to uh, the environmental law reforms. Um, so you have this parallel process. As the environmental law reforms are going forward, you also have administrative law reforms and legal system reforms that are happening. Uh, and just to, you know, a couple of examples. Recently, there was the Communist Party's fourth plenum meeting on rule according to law, and also, uh, and there was an outcome from that meeting that had some very interesting uh, legal system reforms in it. And then there's also a five-year plan for legal system reform. 
And the China watchers um, had kind of mixed reactions to, to, the, to these outcomes. Uh, on the positive side, um, you know, they noted that at the rhetorical level, the outcomes embraced several important governance principles, rule according to law, increased transparency, judicial neutrality, procedural regularity. Um, and then also at the operational level, there were some specific actions to stem local protectionism, to stem interference by local officials with, uh, with government, with uh, judicial decisions. Um, so you had a provision uh, on establishing a system for reporting interference by local officials with judicial decision making. You had another provision on reforming uh, jurisdiction of courts to move cases to higher level courts where interference by local officials might be less likely. Um, exactly the kinds of things you would need to do the legal system for reforms like public interest litigation in the environmental protection law to really have a good chance to succeed. Um, but there were some significant caveats as well. So the, here's sort of the negative uh, side of the ledger on uh, the legal system reforms. One is that this is occurring against the backdrop of a lot of anti-Western values rhetoric in China. Um, and there's this notion that uh, that's actually stated, I think, in the in the outcome from the fourth plenum, that these are not meant to these reforms are not meant as Western style separation of powers or judicial independence, uh, and making very clear that the party is still in the driver's seat. Um, so clearly, there's a line that's that that they're not crossing; they're not even coming close to. Um, and then there's also been intensification of controls on activists around, uh, around China. And now there's proposals being floated to, re to restrain foreign NGOs working in China. So there's a lot of kind of um, momentum against uh, the kind of openness and, and legal reforms, too, at the same time that the legal forms are happening. But what does this all mean? Well, part of it might be an issue of labeling. Right. If, if you're going to do legal system reform in China, you want to make very clear that you're not just cloning the Western approach, but that you're developing a Chinese approach. Um, so part, I, I'm not saying it's only labeling, but, I'm, but that labeling may be a significant part of it. Um, you know, some writers have, have, have written about, you know, maybe you, you signal left and then you turn right. Um, maybe there's some of that going on. I think, you know, the bottom line for me is that it's a long march. It's not an overnight transformation. Um, but this is something that I think we'll be, we'll be watching how this plays out very closely. Um, and there's a parallel set of administrative law reforms that are, that are moving forward as well, such as the revisions to the law and legislation um, to increase public participation in decision making at the, in, in, in the administrative law context. Um, so I'm going to stop there and uh, hear from uh, our other experts. And on that last point, though, just maybe because, I don't know, maybe not everyone's a lawyer here, but that last point about the re re revision of the laws on leg legislation to increase public participation in administrative law, can you give an example of what that means? So, I mean, the, 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 the U.S. system parallel would be uh, when EPA issues a regulation um, there, the regulation first is made public in proposed form, and then comments come in from affected stakeholders, whether you know ordinary citizens, academics, uh, industry, um, and then EPA needs to look at those comments. And when we finalize the regulation, we need to um, respond to any kind of substantive, uh, uh, significant comments that came in. Um, so it's that type of process that, that they've um, moved towards in this provision in the law and legislation. So legislation, I think, is translated there, but, it, but it's meant broadly to include what we would call regulations as well. But, as but one thing, just as a, as a segue going to Jay here, but, but we have seen that in, in some of the environmental laws that we're seeing a lot more international or, you know, open for comments and international organizations, the same ones that they're maybe trying to put checks on have been asked to make comments on like the air pollution law. So there's, okay, this is just giving you the context. Think up questions. Jay, are you ready to, um, yes. to hit us? Yeah. All right. 
So the focus of uh, my presentation will be on um, the participation of grassroots in environmental law reforms and in ongoing um, progress in this area. Um, as uh, Jennifer said, I'm with the uh, American Bar Association's Rule of Law Initiative uh, Beijing office. And in the environmental area, we've been working for about five years um, with grassroots environmental NGOs uh, of different uh, you know, experience levels and different uh, capacities uh, to build their legal capacity, to build their uh, legal knowledge uh, and their awareness of um, uh, legal processes, uh, the legal system, and, and um, the interactions of different um, agencies uh, to, to participate in um, advocacy and participate in environmental governance. Um, in this effort, we've connected them also with environmental lawyers, uh, especially experienced environmental lawyers, including uh, Zhang Jingjing's um, organization, the Center for Legal Systems to Pollution Victims, as well as other environmental lawyers. And we've also connected them with um, domestic and international legal experts. Um, this has been an ongoing effort, and it continues to be ongoing. Um, uh, and in this effort, uh, we've seen that these grassroots organizations, these grassroots environmental organizations, have a sort of two, uh, have a dual role. Uh, on the one hand, especially um, as, as public participation began, there were key pioneer organizations that were really sort of uh, leading the charge or um, uh, pushing to find a role for environmental civil society in um, uh, in governance, in environmental governance. Uh, and then, as those organizations established uh, some, uh, sort of proved their utility uh, and, and showed that they uh, could be a benefit to improving um, environmental uh, regulation, environmental enforcement, there were uh, codifications in um, various areas and various laws as well as regulations that sort of approved of their role and, and formally allowed it. Uh, and then that, that opened the door for the rest of the NGOs that had not, uh, you know, been sort of, uh, did not have the history or did not have the capacity to sort of lead that charge. They could now um, participate in, in environmental regulation as well. So I wanted to start by sort of distinguishing um, what I mean by grassroots uh, when I say grassroots participation. Uh, there, there are at least three sort of um, categories, I think, or three sort of types of uh, public participation or civil society, environmental civil society in China. Uh, the first I think of as public interest lawyers, and that includes, for example, the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims. Um, these are lawyers, they're practicing lawyers with legal backgrounds and who have a significant uh, or uh, senior, extremely senior um, level of experience in dealing with environmental disputes and um, environmental pollution and so on. The second type of organization uh, I'm thinking of uh, as the national level environmental advocates. Uh, for example, um, IP, Majun, um, uh, other organizations at that sort of level uh, that have been uh, on the scene for quite a long time and have been engaged in advocacy from the sort of uh, high level uh, national level regulation or national level uh, reforms. And then the third type is what I'm focusing on, what um, some of our work in this area is focused on, which is the grassroots environmentalists. A lot of them start out as, you know, noticing that there, there's a local pollution problem before, you know, long before Chai Jing um, documentary. Um, noticing that there were local pollution problems, noticing that, you know, cancer incidents, uh, incidences of cancer were uh, rising sharply. Um, or having some contact with the national level advocates or even with lawyers uh, and, and realizing that this is a problem and wanting to help out, uh, wanting to participate in this. So there, uh, there have been a lot of, uh, a rapid increase in the third type of organization uh, in their participation in environmental law. Um, And then I wanted to talk about, give sort of three examples uh, as uh, maybe case studies uh, of how uh, these grassroots organizations have been um, both pushing the envelope and then uh, benefiting from increased uh, 
increased space, legislative and regulatory space to participate uh, in environmental uh, regulation. Uh, the first is open government information requests. Uh, the second is public interest litigation. And the third is legislative advocacy or legislative reforms uh, through participating in co public comment periods on pending laws and regulations, as well as other means. Um, and again, uh, to, to a more or less degree, each one of these areas uh, or each one of these mechanisms began with um, an opportunity arising, uh, an opportunity of you know varying levels of clarity from zero to uh, you know regulation such as OGI, what we call OGI for short, um, OGI regulations uh, allowing citizens to request information, uh, and then environmental grassroots NGOs sort of taking that and running with it. Uh, and using it and exploring it in 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 um, in innovative ways, um, and then uh, legislatures or or government bodies uh, codifying that in increased uh, or that wider role uh, for them. So first is open government regulations. Um, these went into effect in two thousand eight. Um, how many people are familiar with these? I don't want to. Okay, uh, I'll introduce a little bit then. Um, they uh, began with pilot programs in the early 2000s, and then the national regulations were passed by the state council and went into effect in 2008. They, broadly speaking, they allow citizens to request government information. Um, there are exceptions for commercial secrets, trade secrets, national security, um, private information, uh, etc. But broadly speaking, they do allow. Uh, for common citizens to request a wide variety of information. Um, and then immediately after the national or the, the general OGI regulations were passed, the then State Environmental Protection Agency, the predecessor to the Ministry of Environmental Protection, uh, promulgated follow-on regulations specifically for environment-related information transparency. Those regulations provided, as I've quoted here, citizens, legal persons, and other organizations uh, to file requests for environmental information. This was one of the, uh, I think, one of the early um, pieces of, of, of law or, or you know, um, legal document that uh, recognized that organizations can request uh, this information, or organizations can, can <clears throat> excuse me, can uh, uh, have, have, have the ability to seek this type of information. Uh, and it's hard to understate the impact, I think, um, of the OGI regulations. Um, of, of the sort of game-changing uh, effect that they have had. Uh, some of the impact uh, includes they opened a legal channel for NGOs to communicate with government. NGOs could, in their own name, um, request information. For strategic reasons, they might not always want to do so. They might, uh, you know, identify an individual who could request in the individual's name. But uh, even, if it, even if in those situations, uh, it was necessary to request an individual's name, they could then uh, use the information, for example, emissions information that was obtained from the local Environmental Protection Bureau. They could then approach um, the Environmental Protection Bureau with independent emissions data that they collected from a field investigation and say, hey, this doesn't match up. Uh, and then, you know, uh, talk about ways to work with the EPB to uh, to uh, address the pollution, to address the um, illegal activity. Uh, so that was the first sort of really key impact. The second one is that it exposed uh, grassroots NGOs to the world of legal advocacy. Uh, a lot of these grassroots NGOs beforehand had not really been involved in uh, and weren't really sure of how they could be involved or just weren't aware of the world of um, law, to put it so sort of simplistically. Um, they. A lot of them were focused on environmental education and raising awareness of environment, or uh, some of them were scientists and had a very strong technical background, but they were not very aware of what the laws said, uh, the responsibilities both of uh, polluters as well as enforcers uh, and the abilities of enforcers. So with the OGI regulations, um, these NGOs had to, uh, they both wanted to and they had to learn. For example, if you want to request information, you have to find out which, which bureau you need to request it from, which is the proper bureau, uh, how many days they have to, they are allowed to uh, respond to your request so that you can then sort of follow up with uh, additional steps if they are not responsive. So 
it, uh, that's going into the third point, it exposed them to uh, legal advocacy and then it both inspired and required them to learn about uh, the, lar the, the growing panoply of uh, environmental laws and regulations. And then um, some additional impacts uh, were that uh, because of the OGI regulations, uh, NGOs, or through the OGI regulations, NGOs could start to help administrative enforcers uh, uncover violations of law. Um, not entirely unsimilar or dissimilar to the U.S. is that environmental enforcers in China are overworked and understaffed. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, they... <coughs> If they have, uh, you know, five factories or however many factories at this point, it's probably hundreds, to to regulate, um, they don't have the resources to regularly inspect all of them. Uh, and so, uh, independent uh, grassroots organizations that are based in near those areas where the pollution is happening, they are in a lot of times a better position to understand what is going on, changes with the local community, uh, effects of pollution, etc. And so they can uh, have sometimes more of a finger on the pulse uh, of, of any changes to the local environment uh, or uh, environmental damage. Uh, and, and so they can take that information and, and work with local EPBs, local enforcers, to, to um, improve enforcement or inspect or to uh, at least engage the polluters. Um, different from the U.S., um, the Local enforcers' authority in China is sometimes a bit ambiguous in terms of um, there are other interests that sometimes compete with uh, the enforcement interests uh, or the uh, you know shutting down the polluter sort of um, uh, aspect of environmental enforcement. So we've seen that um, in some instances, local environmental protection bureaus. Uh, appreciate the assistance of, or the, the voice, the additional voice of a grassroots NGO to help them uh, tip the scales, to help tip the scales uh, in favor of enforcement, in favor of um, reducing the emissions or uh, taking further action. And this has uh, especially been true as local governments are more and more concerned about um, uh, public demonstrations or public um, uh, not non-harmonic displays of um, uh, public... Uh, <laughs> Or maybe, in theory, losing their job. Right. right? Which is tied to, yes, is, losing their job. I'm waiting for it. <laughs> it's me to me. <laughs> um, so that's uh, OGI. Again, it's been, it's really been a game changer, and it continues to be. And I'll, I'll come back to it a little bit later, because under the new uh, environmental protection law, OGI has been sort of expanded to OEI, uh, uh, Enterprise Information, where polluters, uh, an increasing number of polluters, are required to disclose their emissions information. The second uh, example I sort of want to give is public interest litigation. Um, this was, this is maybe sort of the, possibly the most um, mm, grassroots initiated uh, r recent reform in environmental law. Uh, in, uh, it started out, I believe, with um, a uh, All China Environment Federation, which is an NGO that it's not, not entirely an NGO. Um, it has some um, government uh, support and affiliation. They had started to bring some public interest cases um, before there was any sort of legislation or regulations on it. Uh, and in some cases, they were able to bring them um, with some success. But fully independent uh, environmental litigation, uh, public interest litigation, was non-existent. Uh, and then, how many people here are familiar with the Chujing case in, in Yunnan province related to chromium pollution? Okay. I'll give a basic introduction then. Um, it, it started uh, with um, livestock that were grazing after a heavy rain, and then a large uh, number of the livestock died. Uh, and uh, the the um, herder whose livestock had died uh, went to the local uh, local government or local village committee and uh, you know claimed uh, complained of the, the 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 death of his livestock and then eventually made its way to a uh, a grassroots NGO um, and a, a couple of grassroots NGOs actually working together and they um, 
decided to try and bring it, uh, try to sue for the environmental damage in the names of their organizations. So rather than the traditional sort of pollution tort case, which um, uh, ha, uh, Zhang Jining will talk about uh, shortly, um, this was suing in the name of the NGO, not for personal damages and not for personal harm, but for the harm to the environment and the cost to clean up the environment. Um, these NGOs, uh, there was, again, there was zero uh, legislation on this at the time. Uh, so this was truly sort of a pioneering uh, effort. Uh, the local court, uh, in, uh, this was also uh, somewhat of a surprise, uh, agreed to accept the case um, with the condition that the NGOs uh, bring in the local Environmental Protection Bureau as a co-plaintiff. Um, I think that that reflected some level of uncertainty about what these NGOs really are up to and what is their real motive. So bringing in the uh, Environmental Protection Bureau both um, added some uh, assurance of quality or assurance of uh, um, uh, supervision uh, as well as uh, making sure that things were um, uh, on track. Uh, so that was the um, that case is still pending, and that has um, that that that's a longer story, <laughs> but that case is still pending. Uh, but it was the first case of an independent uh, NGO filing suit uh, on as public interest litigation. That gave rise to uh, sort of a couple of dominoes uh, falling in terms of uh, legislation changes. Uh, the first was the civil procedure law which uh, was amended uh, and the revised version went into effect, I think 2012, if I'm remembering right. Uh, there was a new section uh, that allowed for public interest litigation um, by an authority or relevant organization. Uh, and I'll circle back to the, the specific language here because that was also uh, a grassroots effort to obtain this language. So the civil procedure law allowed for uh, public interest litigation. That was the first uh, legislative change. And then the second was the environmental protection law, <clears throat> which in a, in a intermediate draft named one, uh, one organization as eligible to bring public interest litigation, the All China Environment Federation, uh, a, a semi-independent uh, NGO. But in the final draft, was revised to allow uh, NGOs that have been legally registered with civil affairs departments and have been engaged in uh, environmental protection work for five years or more without any record of illegal activity. This includes a much broader range of NGOs that are independent and grassroots um, uh, and is a sort of rolling uh, uh, rolling qualification as an NGO registers and in five years uh, they can then become qualified to bring public interest litigation. So this was a very, very uh, big change uh, in terms of uh, providing a formal role for uh, independent grassroots organizations uh, to, uh, through the judiciary uh, or through the courts, to engage in um, pollution, work around pollution and work around environmental regulation. Uh, following on that, the change in the new environmental protection law, the Supreme People's Court quickly, uh, quite quickly, came out with a judicial interpretation further um, elaborating on what types of organizations and uh, what the, f the scope and the terms of public interest litigation would be. And there were a few uh, quite key points uh, in that judicial interpretation as far as public participation uh, of um, grassroots NGOs. It, solidified the role of those independent, independent NGOs by specifying, uh, there was a little bit of ambiguity in the new um, law about which organizations exactly could bring suit. And so this clarified that and reinforced the law. Uh, it also contained presumptions in favor of NGOs, uh, in favor of plaintiffs. For example, um, if a, uh, an emitter, an enterprise, uh, should have or was known to have certain information that they refused to disclose, then that information was presumed to be in favor of the plaintiff. Uh, so if the uh, emitter, for example, has pollution data that it's, it's supposed to have and it's legally required to have, but they refuse to disclose it, 
um, the court would assume uh, that the plaintiff's allegation that the emissions data is exceeding what it should be, that the, that the emitter was, uh, you know, polluting illegally, that would be assumed to be true. That is uh, also quite a powerful presumption. Um, the third is that uh, public interest litigation requires notice to the relevant administrative authorities within 10 days of filing. Uh, and this echoes a little bit um, uh, citizen suits in the U.S., which are the mechanism by which U.S. nonprofit organizations uh, can file independent uh, lawsuits around litigation. But in the U.S., it's uh, between 60 days and 120 days, depending on the uh, uh, well, legislation, I believe. Justice Department colleagues, 60 to 90 days? 60 to 90 days. Um, in the Chinese case, it's 10 days. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> In the Chinese case, I believe also unlike the U.S. case, there is no um, pa there's no stay on the litigation, uh, so the litigation can go forward, and you can have instances where there's uh, the administrative agency taking action as well as the public interest litigation going forward simultaneously. Um, finally, settlement agreements are to be publicized, uh, I believe, for 30 days um, before uh, they are to be entered. So uh, that. That in and of itself is another um, a potential, uh, potentially strong uh, indication of increased public participation because you have to, um, you have to publicize the agreements. You can't have, uh, for example, uh, an emitter having a private settlement with an NGO uh, or with other plaintiffs in these cases. And then um, there are still areas for, for further improvement uh, of public interest litigation. Uh, the first, as I um, just mentioned, there's only a 10-day notice uh, to the administrative agency, and there's no stay uh, the, on the public interest litigation, so the case is not paused. Um, so you have this awkward um, situation where there's a, an independent civil suit as well as possibly an administrative enforcement action going at the same time. Um, that, that has that could has the potential of um, having this uh, number one is parallel tracks potentially that may result in conflicting outcomes, but number two there there's this sort of effect where uh, um, the enforcement power in some way to some extent is uh, perhaps t taken out of the the government sphere and and um, outsourced to an independent NGO. Uh, and the enforcement should really perhaps be uh, primarily with the government, uh, where NGOs can help identify and help um, pursue cases if the government is, is unable or otherwise not in a position to enforce those cases. But um, uh, the idea of just sort of having an independent track uh, of public interest litigation, of independent civil litigation that doesn't uh, have a deeper integration with uh, enforcement can be problematic. Uh, and then the second and third um, uh, points I've, I've uh, put up here are specifically about how to do remediation. Uh, remediation is uh, still in its very infancy in China. How do you clean up land that's been polluted? How do you uh, make it usable for, for agriculture, for uh, living? Uh, for d further development after it's been polluted. Uh, the, these types of standards and how a court or how even the administrative agencies should supervise this type of remediation, this type of cleanup, is, is still very ambiguous. Uh, and if, you're, if, if the remediation order comes out through litigation, who supervises the remediation? Uh, if there's a fund or if, there, if the defendant is ordered to pay for the remediation, where does that money go and who supervises it? Uh, that's, uh, that's all uh, still up in the air. And the third example uh, is legislative advocacy or, again, legislative reform. Um, this picture, uh, incidentally, is of a large uh, fish kill that happened just a couple of days ago uh, in Guangdong province. Which, which river? Forgetting which river? Okay, oh, I'll look it up. Yeah. We'll find it. It's, it's in Huizhou. In, in, in Huizhou. Huizhou, okay. And this is the one that triggered the protests recently. Is that right? It was two or three days ago. I'm yeah. not sure if there have been protests yet. 
Um, so in the area of public participation in legislative reforms, uh, there have been three quite recent instances, uh, the civil procedure law, the environmental protection law, and then uh, the Supreme People's Court's judicial interpretation uh, under the new environmental law. Um, in each of these cases, um, <clears throat> uh, grassroots organizations participated in different ways in changing the, the ultimate, uh, or having an effect on the ultimate language that was put into uh, the law or uh, judicial interpretation. Uh, with the civil procedure law, uh, I'm referring to the, the first instance, or the first <clears throat> codification of public interest legal, uh, litigation. Uh, the original language, I believe, said um, an association can bring public interest litigation, but the way that the term that was used in Chinese uh, meant more formal or perhaps more official organizations. So uh, grassroots NGOs uh, took an effort to change it to the word organizations, which included them. Um, uh, at the end of the day, the civil procedure law was still a little bit um, ambiguous. Uh, so part of the reason, uh, I believe part of the reason that the Chujin case is still pending is that despite um, the civil procedure law, there uh, was not clear enough instruction on the terms and the scope of public interest litigation. Um, enter the environmental protection law. Uh, the early draft that named one organization, uh, the All China Environment Federation, when news of that draft um, uh, came into um, the, uh, uh, when grassroots organizations became aware of that draft and that language, um, they, uh, they, they, they coordinated an open letter uh, to uh, the legislators and to the drafters and published it on Weibo, on China's Twitter. Uh, calling on them uh, not to not to draft the law in this way, not to draft the law in such a restrictive way, and in such a way that um, names a specific organization in a national level law, uh, and they were successful. Um, the the eventual uh, terms of that provision were were much broader, uh, as I uh, described before. As far as the judicial interpretation um, goes. Uh, NGOs and lawyers uh, sat down uh, when the draft judicial interpretation was released for public comment. Uh, 30 days were given uh, for public comment, and this is, in, I, I believe, is increasingly common. I see this. I seem to see this more and more that um, legislation, when it's in the draft phase, is is released to the public for public comment, and anyone can comment. You can comment online, um, and. Uh, NGOs and lawyers uh, sat down and, and talked about the provisions line by line uh, and went through it in, in great detail and gave very, very specific suggestions about each provision. Uh, and many of those suggestions were adopted. Um, uh, so that was another uh, example of uh, this, this uh, grassroots level of um, participation in, in the legislative reforms. Um, I sort of wanted to end on this uh, this this uh, section from the revised environmental protection law, which is this is the type of uh, sort of indicator or um, provision that is giving organizations some cause for uh, cautious optimism. Uh, I'll read it very quickly: Citizens, legal persons, and other organizations shall, according to the law have the rights to obtain environmental information and participate in and oversee environmental protection. Uh, the second section, I won't read the whole paragraph, but it says basically that the administrative agencies uh, should, according to law, disclose this information and improve procedures for public engagement to, participate, to facilitate participation in and oversight of protection, environmental protection by these citizens, legal persons, and other organizations. This is a brand new section, uh, and it's a very clear statement that, uh, that favors public participation and a clear role for um, civil society organizations uh, in environmental governance. Uh, it's also not on its own. The, um, the expansion of, as I mentioned before, the, the types of information, the number, the types of polluters or emitters that are required to disclose uh, information about their emissions and about their pol pollution reduction equipment has also increased under the new EPL. Uh, and there are fines uh, for failure to disclose, and if they are found to 
fail to disclose, they have to, they're be, they will be forced to disclose it anyway. So this is uh, the most recent uh, sort of statement from uh, the National People's Congress about public participation uh, in environmental governments. And it's giving NGOs um, reason for cautious optimism. Uh, there are now uh, two or three or so public interest litigation cases pending in the courts. The first one was accepted on January 1st, the day the new law went into effect. Uh, and everyone is, uh, is, is sort of waiting to see what's going to happen. Where the backdrop to you know, this type of optimism uh, is always sort of, okay, it looks good on paper. Uh, let's see how it's implemented. So um, uh, people uh, are waiting to see how these cases come out and how these, uh, the new law is interpreted. Okay, Thank you. great. I forgot to do it for Steve. Can we do, just while I'm changing the PowerPoint, applause for both the two guys who were talking? <laughs> and I think that um, maybe we could talk about, maybe we could talk, because we're podcasting, maybe we could talk about in the Q&A, because I'm wondering about where you're seeing in terms of, you know, when there's the, the right to ask for information, that means the governments themselves, like when the open government information law came out, I think it was a wee bit of a surprise to a lot of local governments and that they didn't necessarily have procedures. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of curious, because my sense in the beginning was like everyone was just making it up along the way. So kind of thinking about that. Sure. Okay, Jing Jing, are you ready? Yes. He didn't steal your thunder, did he? <laughs> kidding. All right. Did you give her the clicker? Oh. She's dangerous. Better be able to let her have it. <laughs> Make sure you're talking to Mike. Thanks. Okay. It's my uh, pleasure to be a, a speaker again at the China Environment Forum uh, at Wilson Center. Uh, in, in the past 15 years, it, would, it is my third time being a speaker here. And during Frequent feeder card coming up. <laughs> during the, the 15 years, I was litigating uh, environment case and uh, have been participating in the development of the public interest litigation in China. My professional trajectory reflects the trend of the public interest lawyering in China, from the legal aid to public interest litigation and NGO empowerment. Um, today, my talk will uh, touch three uh, subjects, the history of the, and the development of the environment litigation in China, and which is not uh, uh, very long, and so don't be <laughs> worried. <laughs> uh, and the second is strength and the uh, limitation of the environment public interest litigation. And third is the uh, big picture of the public uh, interest lawyering in China. As uh, uh, Jennifer uh, introduced, uh, uh, I was uh, the litigator and uh, I have been practicing environment law uh, at the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution with Team um, for years. Um, and uh, I am very happy to say I was, uh, uh, I am the one of the um, practicing lawyer uh, who uh, tried to push the envelope and try to form the public interest litigation in China on the environment issue. So we see this uh, new legislation and it, it is a big progress. And, um, but when we talk about the public interest litigation, environment public interest litigation, we have to talk about uh, our other type of environment litigation. Uh, back in 1990s, uh, people, Chinese people started uh, bringing um, their case conflict caused by pollution to the court. And you can see the article in publishing in 2000, uh, the year of the 2000, um, named pollution victims start to fight back in China. That is the case where my uh, my previous boss, uh, Professor Wang Sanfa, who is the founder of the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victim, uh, represent uh, uh, this uh, far uh, farmer and <laughs> file a litigation in the court. We call it the, the, the first uh, case, dark, dark uh, uh, case, because uh, the, the farmer raised the uh, duck and uh, um, those duck was uh, died of, uh, because of the pollution. 
So that is the first case uh, published on the uh, Western media on the, how the Chinese people um, start using court to protect their personal interests after the pollution affect their uh, political rights and their, uh, their economic rights and their health. And you will see uh, another article uh, published in 2006, and it's taking China to court. Very big uh, name, but the, that is one of my case. And uh, I was helping the farmers uh, now who are uh, living along the uh, Go River, one of the, um, the river in the Huai, most polluted uh, river, uh, Huai River region. And um, so you, you can see in, from the end of the 1990s to 2008, we, have, we had a lot of uh, litigation raised by the uh, victim, we call it the pollution victim who suffered pollution and tried to find legal aid lawyers to help them. And we played that though as a, being a uh, legal aid lawyer and provide our free legal uh, service to them. And but, uh, I feel that uh, I uh, help them. We reach some uh, our goal to pro clean up the environment. But the um, the weakness of the uh, the this uh, private uh, tort case is um, our clients, the people who suffered pollution always uh, seeking uh, compensation while um, environment lawyers or NGO uh, have a different role. Our role is to use the law to clean up the environment to, to uh, prevent uh, pollution happen. So we have a, a different goal uh, when we use the, this uh, personal uh, tort case uh, to achieve our goal, there's some conflict of interest. So we feel there's a urgent to um, find a new type of litigation where the, which uh, lawyers and NGOs can work together to better achieve our own goal to clean up the environment, pre prevent uh, pollution happen. Um, but you can see back in the uh, middle of the, uh, like around 2005, uh, uh, we, uh, by using a private uh, tort case, we, we achieve a lot of goals. Um, like, because we can, in that time, uh, we can use group litigation, class action. Um, here is a case I always want to in, uh, introduce. It is one of my, uh, uh, winning case, very few winning case. Uh, uh, we successfully uh, helped the 1,721 1, villagers uh, get got composition from a chemical uh, company. And there, this is one of the nine uh, cases choose by uh, Chinese Supreme Court uh, as a uh, uh, typical environment uh, litigation last year. So this is the one of the sample uh, litigation, environment litigation um, case. Um, it's real because uh, after 2007, uh, Supreme Court uh, issued uh, an internal uh, document which forbidden uh, um, people file a uh, group litigation and uh, requires the local court split uh, all group litigation to individual case. So you won't see the big class action case after 2007. Um, yeah, that, that is the reason we feel uh, we have to figure out a new way to use a uh, courtroom. And from the, the time uh, 2000, uh, 2007 to 2012, um, you can find many testing public interest litigation. There were many players, except uh, a real grassroots NGO that uh, Jay in, uh, introduced. There are many other uh, players. First is the uh, uh, prosecutor, local prosecutor office. Uh, surprisingly, the local um, prosecutor office have had a very high incentive to uh, use uh, uh, litigation uh, to achieve their goal. They filed uh, um, the case uh, and in Guangzhou um, to you know, pursue to litigate a, a company. 
uh, for its water pollution in 2008. And you see uh, many other um, prosecutor uh, office initiate public interest litigation around 2007 to 2010. Uh, but su surprisingly, the, in our new uh, environment protection law, prosecutor office are not included uh, as uh, um, the uh, plenty for the uh, public interest litigation. Uh, the second type is uh, Gango. Uh, Jay was uh, very polite and not uh, uh, calling them uh, Gango. Uh, Gango is a government-controlled non-government uh, organization. It <laughs> sounds weird, but uh, it is uh, uh, reality in China. Gango, you, if you heard those uh, words like All China uh, Environment Federation, All China Women's Federation, they're not real grass uh, NGO, the grassroots uh, non-government organization. They are government-supported organ organization. Some of them, uh, their staff are public servants. Can you imagine uh, you find some uh, government uh, servant had a real grassroots uh, NGO like a friend of the uh, nature? You won't. But in those uh, gango, you, you will find them. Uh, but I have to admit, it is uh, uh, all China uh, uh, Environment Federation, uh, which open push the envelope and help the, the NGO grassroots NGO to gain the legal standing uh, in the public interest litigation. And the SEF filed this uh, its first uh, uh, public interest lit uh, litigation in uh, at Wuxi Environment Court in two thousand nine. That was very successfully uh, start. Um, open the door uh, to the, the social organization. They, this organization did good, some good things. Um, the third type is the local environment protection bureau. Uh, you can see the, the case in Kunming, the local Kunming Environment Protection Bureau filed a case uh, uh, against the pig farm uh, in 2009. And you can see the first uh, 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 such a, a case uh, in uh, Guizhou at the first uh, um, environment tribunal in Qingzheng, uh, Guizhou province. Uh, the, the last one is a real grassroots uh, NGO uh, uh, case, uh, which uh, Jay already mentioned. The first one is uh, Friend of Nature uh, filed this uh, case in uh, Qijing, uh, Yunnan province in 2000. So you, you can see all of uh, those uh, players try to push the envelope, try to form the uh, new type of public interest litig uh, environment uh, litigation and try to get the legal standing. And eventually the, the, uh, some NGO, some grassroots NGO uh, got uh, legal standing since uh, January 1st uh, this year. And yeah, very interesting. I want to uh, introduce some uh, case. Uh, um, the one of the case we in Chinese we call the, the, the you can see uh, um, on many uh, Chinese um, media called the Tianjia Huanbao Gong Yi Song. This is a Taizhou Environment Protection uh, Environment Federation uh, suing sued uh, six companies uh, last year. It's very surprising because the the composition is very high. The so RMB is 160 million. Uh, it's, uh, US dollar is 26 million. You never see such high composition um, during the in the, the past uh, the history, and uh, also uh, the case has been trial very fast. The, second, uh, the first trial was uh, in September 2014, and the, the final judgment was issued uh, the end, the last day of the last year. So this is a very high speed uh, trial and high composition public interest uh, uh, case. is very interesting and worth uh, um, re discussing. Uh, I still keep some doubt on this uh, case uh, because uh, uh, you can see this is the Taizhou Environment Federation. So you can imagine 
It is not a real grassroots NGO. It's a uh, local government supported uh, non governmental organization, local gango. Is that a lungo? Yeah. <laughs> and it, it was formed, it was founded just in, uh, in last year, February 2014. And definitely it's not, it, it, it didn't meet uh, the criteria on, in the new revised environment protection law. So it won't happen, this case won't happen in uh, this year because our uh, new uh, environment pro protection law uh, went in effective this year and uh, it requires the uh, NGO uh, meet certain criteria to be uh, 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 plenty of in public interest litigation. So this case uh, won't happen uh, afterwards. But you can see um, the high composition, high sp uh, speed trial, and that gives some... Uh, <laughs> That's cool. Yeah, it's good. I, I, I have a mixed feeling of, uh, about this case. Uh, first, it's, it's good for the environment, but on the other hand, I, I think uh, uh, I doubt it is a fair trial because it didn't give enough uh, time to the defendant uh, and it's just too uh, very quick and so I, this is my doubt. And why do we need the uh, environment public interest litigation? Uh, different players may have different answers. As an NGO lawyer, my answer is, like I mentioned, because of the conflict of interest, uh, we cannot always use a, a personal injury uh, tort case to achieve our, our goal to clean up the environment to, to prevent uh, pollution. So we need a uh, um, new type of uh, litigation and NGO and can play its own though, 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 and to prevent uh, pollution. This is our goal. And for the local environment protection bureau, uh, they want to be the plaintiff, to be the party of the public interest litigation because they, they can accept the limitation of the amount of uh, administrative penalty they can issue um, uh, by using uh, public interest litigation. You, you, uh, and for the, the pig farm case in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Kuiming um, City, um, the local environment EPB uh, was asking a million, six million, as I remember, six million compensation um, for the, from the pig farm, which is much higher than the uh, administrative penalty uh, it, it can issue on the pig farm. So I think that's the incentive uh, make the local EPB want to be the plaintiff of, the, of public interest litigation. But unfortunately, in our new revised uh, environment protection law, those uh, e local environment protection bureau are not included in the public interest litigation. And the same as the uh, prosecutor uh, of local prosecutor office, they are not. But now they are trying to use uh, a different way. In our civil procedure law, uh, Article 15, there is a system we call supporting uh, litigation. Uh, I tried uh, when I worked for the Center for Legal Assistance to Pollution Victims by using that system. Uh, that means the, uh, in that article, uh, it's very clear, all the government agency, uh, social organization, uh, and uh, uh, some uh, other uh, agency can support uh, citizens whose uh, rights were, uh, was violated by the uh, other people. So now prosecutor office, uh, especially I saw the, the case in uh, Guangzhou uh, recently, uh, the provincial um, prosecutor office um, use that article to support um, uh, local environment uh, uh, NGOs uh, to file litigation against uh, polluter. They, now they try to figure another uh, legal channel uh, to be a part of the uh, public interest litigation. And my uh, my thoughts uh, on how we can make uh, the public interest litigation work well. 
uh, so it depends on the th uh, those uh, three points. First is a well-developed uh, civil society organization. And without uh, those NGO, you do not have uh, enough plenty. Of, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, under the, this uh, new environment protection law, um, only, I think, uh, uh, it said 300 uh, NGO uh, can get um, legal standing under this new environment protection uh, law. But according to the statistic by survey by the Friend of Nature, only 10 of the, those grassroots NGO have uh, willingness and have a uh, um, professional capacity and have enough funding to file public interest litigation. And among those 300 uh, uh, environment uh, uh, NGOs who may have a, a legal standing, many of them are gungo, like I mentioned, or uh, the uh, All China uh, Environment Federation, or, uh, and it's no co uh, branch. So we need to uh, have the uh, NGO, well uh, established NGO, to be a plaintiff, and we have to. Uh, losing the uh, restriction on the NGO registration, so we have uh, more NGOs. Uh, we need to give some economic incentive to NGO to bring the uh, public interest litigation to the court. And um, in our the, in this uh, new law, the uh, uh, protection law, it forbidden the NGO and seek. Um, profit by using a public interest litigation. So that means you cannot, uh, as an NGO, you, you cannot use uh, litigation to get a, any profit. It is uh, right, but on the other hand, we need to give some incentive, uh, economic incentive for NGOs, and make them uh, willing to use uh, public interest litigation and cover their expense. It, litigation is always expensive. So they need to get the uh, um, economic uh, in incentive. Second is the independence of judiciary. It's a big uh, subject, and uh, um, but it is very important. Uh, and if we want the public interest litigation uh, works uh, well in China, we need to have a, this independent, independent uh, judiciary. But unfortunately, we haven't seen that uh, yet. So we have to lower our expect expectation on the public interest litigation on its role to clean up uh, the environment, to protect uh, uh, the environment. And third, I think it's also uh, very important we need public interest litigation, but we also we need uh, this um, private uh, uh, tort case as well, because on the one hand you see there are only ten uh, uh, real grassroots NGO uh, who which has uh, have the willingness and the capacity to file litigation, and on the other hand you see thousands and thousands uh, of people who suffered pollution and want to bring uh, litigation in the court, want to uh, seek compensation through the uh, uh, judiciary, but they cannot, and they were uh, rejected by the court. So if we that our court open the door to the public and let people who suffer the pollution file litigation. That give enough pressure on the polluters. That, so the both, we need both. We need public interest litigation, which uh, NGOs and the lawyers, the environment lawyers can use to achieve their, their mission and their goal. We also need this uh, private uh, uh, interest case, environment court and uh, administrative case, which allow the citizens, the people, to file the litigation and get the fair compensation when they suffered uh, pollution. And the, the, uh, I think the, the weakness of the public interest litigation is um, the first one, I think, uh, I have to say, that is uh, still an uh, after fact uh, solution. And uh, we cannot use public uh, interest litigation to uh, prevent uh, pollution happen. Because uh, our current model of the uh, public interest litigation in the uh, environment protection law is uh, uh, we call it public. Uh, um, civil um, litigation. 
That means you can only use uh, um, civil procedure law, and after the pollution happened, after the damage happened, you can use uh, such uh, uh, um, public interest litigation and net, uh, NGO to seek uh, the compensation on behalf of the, the ecosystem, on behalf of the, the environment to uh, seek uh, compensation and the clean up. So still, it is an after effect uh, solution. And, and second is a very few uh, social organizations qualified uh, to be the plaintiff. And um, we cannot use administrative uh, uh, litigation law. That is a big, uh, very big uh, uh, weakness. Uh, in our uh, revised, this new revised uh, administrative uh, litigation law, there is no any article on the public interest litigation. But I still I have to say in the past 15 years, uh, in terms of the environment litigation and the trial, uh, we made some uh, progress uh, from the three uh, category of the case issued by the Supreme Court. Uh, you can see we have more and more litigation. That means we uh, some of this uh, conflict caused by pollution uh, was uh, were uh, we accepted by the court. And uh, I mentioned one of my case was selected by the, uh, the Supreme Court last year. And that, uh, those cases uh, um, became the sample case uh, for the law lawyers who are working at more than 100 environmental tribunals all over the China. And it's a training uh, material for them. And you can see this uh, judiciary interpretations, uh, which uh, uh, are very in favor of the environment, in favor of the NGO. And my last point, uh, if, uh, if we want to uh, see the effective uh, public interest litigation, we have to put uh, uh, environment public interest litigation uh, on the bigger uh, picture. Um, First, you, um, you, you didn't see any other uh, public interest litigation on other subjects like the consumer rights, food safety issue, and uh, women's rights, and uh, disabled people's rights. And only, you can only find ongoing public interest litigation on environmental issue. What is the reason why, why we only see uh, uh, one type of a public interest litigation? I have my, uh, ans uh, my own answer. I ho hope to listen to your, uh, your thoughts. And, and so uh, the, you, you, yesterday I heard the news um, and five of the uh, feminist uh, activists uh, were arrest, uh, released after thir uh, 37 uh, days uh, detained by Be Beijing police. Uh, and uh, that you can, you can see that is good news. Uh, it's good news and bad news because they are still in the uh, uh, criminal uh, procedure. And from that, uh, re this uh, recent incident, you, you can see this very harsh, uh, difficult political environment on any citizen movement, any civil society NGOs in China. So if you only see environment NGO uh, finding uh, public interest litigation, that doesn't mean we have very active uh, civil society, we have a, a good in, uh, political environment in, in terms of encouraging uh, people, citizens, and organizations to use the court, use the judiciary to protect their rights. And I, it's a long way. The, the, my last slides is a long march to the green. It's a long march to a fair society, and well, we all have to work hard. Like Sun Zhong said, "革命尚未成功，同志仍需努力." We all have to work hard to achieve our goal. Okay. So Thank you so much. A little bittersweet at the end, but that's okay. Um, well, so we all have to work hard, and nobody works harder than Zhang Jingjing. No, that's yes. true. <laughs> um, oh, no, no, no. Um, I, have the other, uh, I have the other mic up front here. Sorry. 
Um, yeah, so I've got questions, but I, I, these guys are, I could sense. Susan, right there in the corner. So it's, can you ask us some questions? Susan, right in front of you, sorry. Ah, right that, here. Did you have a question, sir? I do. Thank you. He raised. So, and, if you, and, if, and when you ask questions, um, let's tr we only have, you know, and it seems like a lot, but try to, we'll try to be succinct. Tell us who you are, and yeah. My name is uh, Brooks Yeager. I, uh, I'm principal of a group called Birdwell Strategies. Uh, I used to be the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Environment in the Clinton administration, briefly. Um, I'm interested in an aspect that I didn't, uh, I'll, first of all, I, I want to say wonderful presentations, and yeah. I learned a lot, and uh, the, learned the depth of my own ignorance about the Chinese judicial system, for one thing. <laughs> but, um, so I have a, an overall procedural question, which is, to what extent are these reforms reaching beyond the national level and actually affecting local judicial proceedings? That's one question. The more substantial question is the following. Um, uh, all the cases that were cited are local pollution cases, which are very important from the local perspective. Uh, one question is whether they reach into an element of national policy. Uh, China, among other things, is, is a signatory to the uh, Stockholm Convention on Persistent Organic Pollutants. Under that convention, there are certain obligations that ensue, including with regard to di dioxins and furans. Um, the obligation to inventory sources uh, and to use best practices to seek to reduce, reduce sources by as much as 80% uh, over time. Um, so my question is, has there been any thought about a strategy of actually pursuing either litigation or campaigns based on national obligations that China holds internationally and whether or not they're being observed uh, at the national level or not. And the substantial question is, are they? I mean, is China doing something about dioxins and furans and inventorying sources and, um, and, uh, and actually uh, starting to reduce the production of this particular kind of pollutant? I think I have a theme for a new meeting. But yeah, <laughs> so what, what can you guys answer on his question? Thank you so much. Those questions. I, I think all all this uh, first uh, question is uh, how the local judiciary uh, with the, was in, uh, affected by the uh, those uh, new case. Yes, we. I think the in China, um, those case happened on the local court. You won't see any didn't see any case tried by the Supreme Court. They're all happening on the local level, different uh, local level, city level. Uh, on the provincial level, yes, you can see more than 100 uh, environment tribunals all over the China, and they are trying trying to uh, get the case, the lack of the case. They do not have enough case to trial. The, 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 the reason is very, very obvious. The, the, we do not have an independent uh, judiciary. N the local judge, local court, sometimes are afraid of the, um, the they, they are interfered by the local in interest uh, group, and they are free to accept a country, uh, um, conflict uh, case. So, see, the, the, we have this uh, bottom-up uh, uh, movement, uh, include the, the and the funding, the, the stand up, uh, uh, the set up of the tribunal, the environment tribunal, which start from the uh, county level court in Guizhou province. So that is a bottom up uh, movement. You also see the uh, top down uh, you know, solutions. So this is the first, my answer to the question. The, your first, first question. Second, in terms of our international obligation, I didn't see any case uh, to address uh, such an uh, issue. I hope we can, but in, according to our uh, law practice, uh, when we assign an international treaty or convention, we absorb, uh, we absorb it to, uh, to our domestic laws. So we do not uh, sign international treaties, uh, conventions in our uh, you know, litigation. We do not use uh, international treaties, convention as a, a, a law 
uh, in our um, case, litigation case. But I hope uh, um, that actually is my new subject, my new subject for my working, uh, my current work is uh, um, try to hold the Chinese overseas investment accountable. Uh, so that is a new subject, and I hope someday I can use international treaty, the uh, investment treaties, or uh, in, uh, environment uh, convention to hold the Chinese company uh, overseas accountable. Jay, do you want to add anything? Um, to maybe a little bit. Um, on the first question, um, yeah, the, for example, public interest litigation, and um, this touches a bit on Jennifer's follow-up question about OGI uh, at the local level. Um, public interest litigation is a national, the environmental protection law is a national law, but the, the, the reforms as far as public interest litigation go down to the local level. So the cases are all local, um, or, or they start at least at the local level. Uh, that also reflects the, the, the space uh, to to bring these types of cases um, where cases affect local uh, pollution or are you know an instance of a local uh, sort of illegal behavior uh, that that can um, uh, be more easily pursued um, and I, I think that that reflects um, the the sort of difference between national and local uh, to to your latter question as far as uh, for example international conventions or international obligations um, directly using international obligations is is not really a possibility um, so there's sort of uh, there are some organizations that are working to um, bring in to to uh, advocate or, or um, seek reforms uh, so that policies come out, domestic policies come out about the, the, uh, the levels of these, um, for example, POPs. Um, but uh, you can't directly go into court with, uh, with the International Convention. I, I, I have a question like when, um, when Jing Jing talked about the, the Taizhou Environmental Federation case, which was, a, I'm going to call it Lugongo, <laughs> local. <laughs> Government and yeah, it sounds very posh. Um, but so, do, it, are cases like that and some of these others that we've seen? I feel like that there's it's kind of like experiments, or you know, what's the great tongue you? I I you, I'm so bad at Chinese expression. You know, like was it do you, do you kill the monkey to scare the chicken or kill the chicken to scare the monkey? It's, like, <laughs> it's kill, kill the chicken. Don't kill the chicken to scare the monkey. Kill the chicken to scare the monkey. So so you kind of I'm just wondering if that's uh, this example that they rushed the Taijo case through that. You know, maybe some toes were stepped on, but was it maybe meant to scare the pajibis out of industries, which from the top down are being told you must open up your information. You know, you have to report. You have to. You have to. You know, local governments have to say that they're meeting targets. And for the record, right? Remember in the in the Chai Jing film, she noted that only eight of the seventy some cities had actually met the PM two point five targets. So are these other guys losing their jobs? You know, I mean that's. But I mean so. There's more transparency, which which you've all mentioned, but 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 is it still? Are we still just experimenting? The, the, like, are these institutions in waiting, and we're trying to see what works? Yeah, I thought uh, all those uh, um, testing cases uh, were ended by the January first uh, this year because we have the very clear legislation on. Uh, who can uh, bring the public interest <laughs> litigation case? I, th I think that is the reason the case, uh, the Taizhou case, was in, in, on the last day of the last uh, 2014, yeah. because the new law uh, went effective uh, January 1st. And they have to sit on their hands for four more years because they can't <laughs> do it. But uh, actually, I hope on, uh, we have a more people or organizations, include the prosecutor office, the local EPB, are still trying to uh, use uh, innovative uh, way uh, to uh, implement laws. Do you think we might see because of this five-year issue, you know, for NGOs? Do you think we might still see though the handful of NGOs that that are smart in this area? Do you think they'll be? Working more and maybe advising the environmental protection bureaus on this. I mean, that's, I mean, they bonfire. They have no other choice. Right? Yeah. 
I hope. Uh, I think that is one of the choice that they can work on. Is uh, if the NGO uh, have the next five uh, year history, uh, if they want to participate in any uh, those uh, case, what they can do is work with uh, um, NGO. Uh, which has a legal standing and work with local environment protection bureau on the case. So I'm, I'm grasping for optimism here, Jing. Jing <laughs> so I'm just okay, quick, and then I've got some other. We got some highly impatient but lovely people around the room here. Yes. Uh, the NGOs are going to have to be very strategic, right? They're going to have to figure out how they can bring local cases, right? Because they have to be locally registered NGOs under the under the new law in order to be able to bring one of these environmental bill cases. Um, local cases, but with national uh, and perhaps even international impact. So there's a lot of strategy that goes into picking the right kind of case and, and, and building it. But I think it's also important, and I think uh, both of the other speakers touched on this, that the um, environmental public interest litigation should ideally be seen as complementary to government regulation and government enforcement. It's putting really too much on the backs of the NGOs to expect them to carry the weight of environmental protection in China. They can highlight problems, they can fill gaps, um, but it's asking too much for them to carry the whole load. All right, so um, Susan right next to you there, so why don't we gather two questions right there and then the gentleman here and then we'll get you two, okay? Thank you, Jennifer. Hi. Thank you, panel. Excellent presentations. Uh, Cheryl Wasserman, EPA. Um, much of public litigation and in, uh, in public interest litigation in China has been um, uh, after the fact um, w damage uh, assessment, um, tort type litigation. And so my question has to do with two other aspects of public role. Uh, one is environmental pr uh, impact assessment, which had a, a longer history of public comment and, and access, and the recent uh, decision to have a separate analysis on public discord uh, related to environmental impact assessment procedures. And the other has to do with um, violations and whether or not you have access to the kind of information you would need to pursue um, uh, violations of environmental law. For instance, uh, access to the permits and are they really helpful in relation to environmental monitoring information. So two parts to the okay. question. And can we gather one more question right here, Susan? I'm trying to be efficient that this gentleman. Um, is this okay? Yep, there we go. Hi, um, Scott Tanner, CNA. Um, I'd like to ask uh, Zhang Jingjing what she sees as the most important obstacles to court independence in environmental cases. Um, is is it the importance of local party leadership over the courts? Is it uh, is it uh, the uh, economic power of local industries? Is it uh, local control over the court budgets? And, and then just related to that, um, what is the role of the procurator uh, in environmental cases? Do they have, I'm sorry, I came in a little late if I missed something, but I, I came away from this with the question of what if anything is their role regarding uh, environmental law? Okay, I think that's sufficient to keep you all out of trouble for a few minutes. Um, Jay, do you want to start? I don't know. Uh, sure, I can, I can start. Um, to the first question, uh, yes, EIAs have a longer, in, environmental impact assessments have a longer history of public comment, uh, but the implementation of that public comment phase and the public hearing phase was um, left something to be desired. Um, the, as far as that, as well as um, uh, obtaining information for violations of environmental law, that goes back to the open government information regulations uh, because those are really the vehicle for requesting these types of information. And the permits, the environmental impact assessment, um, emissions data on file with the local environmental protection bureau, those are exactly the types of information that can be requested under these. And those are key to building up, if you're going to pursue litigation, those are key to building up the case, obviously. Uh, if you don't pursue litigation, as uh, a lot of NGOs do not, or a lot of advocates generally do not, because 
uh, of the time and the resources required. Uh, once you obtain that information, you can give a call to the local Environmental Protection Bureau or even the emitter themselves and say, look, there's clear information here. Uh, you know, we can go to court with this if, if we wanted to, but we'd like to settle this or, you know, let's find a way to work this out. Um, so, yeah, the, that information and the use of um, the OGI regulations to obtain that is really the key. I'm going to interrupt for a second because go back to my initial question. I asked you that the, because I know that like Majun and isn't it um, NRDC, you know, there's the pollution information transparency index work and, but you, you're sitting in Beijing under the dome. Um, are you are you seeing that our local governments and our, our industries, I mean, have they figured out like how to give out the information? Because I remember when the OGI first passed that, that Chinese citizens, you know, they, they believe they have a right. And they started calling and knocking on doors for all kinds of, you know, not just pollution, but like my pension, where to go, right? And 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 everyone and the, the impulse for, for local governments is like, it's a secret. And I'll be, oh no, wait, do we still have the secret slot? You know. Are, are they, have they created procedures or do companies, what's going on in that front? No, thanks, thanks for circling back to that question. Yeah. Um, the, yeah, for example, the Public Information Transparency Index uh, and other efforts similar to that that rate the information transparency of different government units uh, have been really important. Um, uh, but as, as you're saying, when the OGI regulations came out, especially in the early period, local um, local governments and local uh, agencies that had to respond to these requests, they were not given uh, very clear instructions on no. how to respond to them or even their, their obligations under them. Uh, so um, another uh, aspect of uh, work that we've been doing has been to work with uh, public interest lawyers uh, to, to, to develop both um, uh, increase awareness on the side of citizens and on the side of NGOs that these things are available, that OGI uh, is a type of tool that you can use to request information, but also to work with local governments to train them, uh, even through if it's through the filing of these requests, to uh, show them, to help educate them, you have a responsibility to respond to this and here's the legal basis for it. Um, but that is an ongoing thing and it's sort of a uh, it's continuing to move down the chain of uh, smaller and smaller area or more and more remote areas. Steve? Just to, to come in on this point briefly. So OGI is an incredibly important um, tool for getting information and um, should be used aggressively. I think it is being used uh, by a lot of uh, groups aggressively. And the, the transparency index that you mentioned is, is very useful in showing the uneven implementation from one place to another and, you know, showing the places that are implementing it well as an example to the other places to try to catch up. But um, no, nobody in the public should have to use an OGI request in order to find out where the local pollution is coming from, right? The, 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 the EIA process and the permit process should both result in the limits that are applied to a particular pollution source being public automatically without anyone having to ask. <laughs> um, and if that's not the case yet, then you know maybe there, there's new provisions on permitting in the uh, in the uh, framework law revisions, and there may also be more on that in the air law uh, when that's enacted. Um, I think these could be very important tools for making that kind of information automatically available, as well as the, the trend that Jay mentioned about uh, increased requirements on enterprises themselves to disclose pollution information. So they should be disclosing the information, but the, the permit limits that apply to them should be automatically public. That's a lot of redundancy. The message is transparency, people, and it's just not happening. So maybe we should go make sure I don't want to lose track of our lovely questions yeah. out here. Jing Jing? Yeah, the, uh, I think uh, among all um, so many obstacles, I think the lack of the political uh, will, uh, which uh, allows uh, judiciary trial case independently, is still the biggest uh, obstacle. Uh, if there is a political will, uh, you can solve all other uh, obstacle uh, problems, such as uh, uh, lack of a, a pro professionalized uh, uh, judge and such as uh, interference from local uh, economic uh, in, in, uh, industry uh, in interest group. 
um, if there is a political will. So um, that is, I think, the biggest uh, obstacle. Um, we we need um, uh, the Chinese leadership need to uh, let the judiciary try the case uh, in independently and then let the judge uh, try the case independently make its their own professional uh, judgment. I think, but have, I don't know if we met Scott. Do, do we? Approach, I don't think we. I think we got. We took that little side country road, kind of off the highway. And now we're coming back. You had a question about the procuriate, about their role. Oh, sorry. Here, sorry. Got it. We're, 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 unless you can yell real loud. What I heard during the presentation uh, were things that the procuracy is not allowed to do regarding. I was wondering what their role is regarding environmental okay. law. Okay. The second question is about the, the uh, procuratory, yeah, prosecutor, uh, local prosecutor office role. Uh, like I mentioned, in around 2007, 2008, there were many uh, cases uh, filed by the local prosecutor office on the pollution issue. They themselves uh, uh, played as a plaintiff, the uh, fire litigation at the local court. Um, but in our new environment protection uh, law, um, they are not uh, accepted. Uh, as a plaintiff of the public interest litigation. But now uh, I see another testing case uh, uh, in Guangdong province. Again, uh, the, the local Baiyun district uh, prosecutor office uh, using the Article 15 in civil procedure law to support an NGO to file lit litigation. So it is not a part of the litigation. It, it's playing a supported role in that case, but it is uh, uh, it has uh, its uh, legal standard in the the case in the um, litigation. They so can only use the Article uh, 15 in civil procedure law right now. I think they try to gain the the, the standards again as a, a party of the public interest litigation. But but most of the procuratorates do not see bringing pollution cases, this is what we've heard, that most of them do not see bringing pollution cases as a central part of their role. Is that is that correct? There are some argument uh, among, between the uh, scholar, legal scholars and uh, practitioners, and uh, some people are very supportive uh, to the um, uh, prosecutor to use uh, uh, lit litigation, uh, but others are against. So there are some uh, doubts, there are some arguments. I think that is the reason uh, the, the, those uh, group uh, who are against the uh, uh, prosecutor's role in public interest litigation won. So uh, you didn't see in this uh, revised environment protection laws uh, the prosecutor office uh, gain the legal standing as a plenty of the public interest litigation. Um, but other group, I think the some uh, local prosecutor office are working right now try to gain the standing. Uh, again, I do not know how, when they, they can uh, get uh, the standing back, um, but they are trying to use uh, a different legal channel, which is uh, Article 15 in uh, civil procedure law. Great eco entrepreneurship in the law community yeah. there. All right, we're going to take this question here. We'll, we'll gather a couple of questions again. Hi. Hi. Um, Cynthia Giles, EPA Enforcement. So, um, interested in the extent to which you think it is a failure of standards uh, that leads to the pollution versus implementation of adequate standards. And on the implementation side, to follow up with what Steve, what Steve was saying, um, the power of transparency that you don't have to ask but the information is just publicly available. Is there, do you think, uh, interest uh, on the part of the government of tapping that uh, the power of public uh, perception as to industry as well as government? Is there interest in pursuing that uh, approach? I, in the U.S., we governments are ambivalent, I would say, although they understand the, the power of that, and I can imagine the same is true there, but I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. Okay. and then. Um, there's a there's a woman in the back, and then this gentleman here. 
Hi, um, I'm at the University of Wisconsin Madison. My question is uh, more thematic. Um, I hear the discussion about the top-down uh, reform and regulation, and we, we heard about civil society, gongos, NGOs, etc. Missing piece from what I what I'm not hearing is what about the people of China, what about citizens, what about the people who are confronting pollution daily who are the most familiar with whether or not there are pollution problems. Um, there was an oblique reference to that with regard to s questions of stability. Um, what is the national government's, what is the central government's interest in controlling or remedying pollution problems, it's, you know, protests, et cetera, but I didn't hear anything about what role you see for citizens. Um, and that sort of leads into the other question, which um, uh, Zhang Jingying, I thought, had a very important point about why we're only seeing public interest litigation in environmental cases. The environmental legal reform is not functioning or occurring in a vacuum. It is part of the larger legal system issue. And I'm curious about how if the function and capacity and enforcement of the legal system at large in China is problematic, how does how can we have the expectations that the compartment of environmental um, legal reform is going to somehow be more effective or play a role or be a path to resolving pollution issues? Okay. That last one that has Steve written all over it. But let's answer these and, and walk over and get the microphone next to this very patient gentleman here, Susan. So, okay, start answering those first questions from Cynthia. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'll just touch on that and then uh, uh, go to the other one and hope my colleagues can, can complete the answer on that. But, you know, I, I think on the, is it failure of standards, implementation, uh, I think it's all of the above. I think it's really, um, there are huge gaps in Chinese environmental law. That's why there's such a, uh, such an aggressive uh, move, really, by the government to legislate, to try to fill in those gaps. Uh, the question that, that Brooks asked about, um, is, is there any implementation going on on the POPs Treaty that, that China's a, a party to? Um, uh, so, you know, so we, we have these huge gaps in the law, but of course, it's not just what's on the page that's important, it's, it's what's actually implemented, and I, there's been a lot um, written in the sort of Chinese environmental law literature about the implementation gap. And so I think that's very important too. The fact we were just alluding to that the, the um, local prosecutors don't see bringing environmental cases as a basic part of their job. And I'm glad to hear that there's at least a debate in the legal community about that. Um, but that's something that, that hopefully um, can be moved forward. Um, on. Uh, uh, yeah, and uh, on the link between environmental law reform and the legal system, I think I think th that's that's a very important issue. Um, is the are the problems in the legal system going to hold back these reforms? Um, you know, or maybe another way to look at it is is environmental law reform kind of a wedge right. for moving things forward in China for moving the legal reforms, among other things, forward, and for beginning to focus more on things that matter to ordinary people in their day-to-day -day life. That is, is really the hope, that um, this political space now exists in environmental law in China that can move a lot of things in a forward direction. I mean, just to inter interject there, I mean, when, when, when I started off talking about the, the film Under the Dome, I mean, we, we did a screening of it. I mean, you guys know the story that, like, you know, what was it, in two days, how about 200 million people watched it? And so that the Chinese, you know, there's been a national conversation, but it's, it's already been there. And I think that, you know, I mean, that was like, I guess that, that's the elephant in the room. That, I mean, it's the people, it, that's the big, in my mind, that's the fire kind of lighting the fears in the government and inspiring the lawyers and the NGOs to act. But all that let them kind of talk. But, but I think that, but also the last thing on the environmental law, when we look at, like, in the, on the clean energy, on the energy law, you know, a lot of the clean energy standards that, and that have led to real growth in energy efficiency and renewables and, you know, slight decrease in coal, that, that, that has really been motivated because of the pollution. And, and, and so that, you know, and it's been really kind of exciting to see that developing. 
But what's really hindered is, is the gap that we're discussing today is that the actual enforcement of the pollution. It's almost like they're trying to use clean energy law to work on the pollution issue. It didn't work. Okay, Jay and Ching Jing Jing got a few more comments here. Sure. Um, on the, the question of standards, uh, when you go to, uh, you know, when you talk with lawyers in China, uh, environmental lawyers, about what are the biggest difficulties, uh, as Steve said, I think standards is just part of the bigger issue. I, if I'm not mistaken, standards have been have not been updated for a while, uh, possibly 95 uh, in some cases, uh, but the maybe. Uh, equally large or even bigger problems are um, uh, some of the systemic ones, like cases will not be accepted even though they should be accepted by the courts, so that um, you, you can't get past the front door. Or um, uh, plaintiffs are supposed to, pollution plaintiffs, um, pollution victims are supposed to enjoy a presumption of causation, that they should not have to prove uh, that the pollution or the emissions caused their uh, alleged harm or um, alleged injuries, but uh, the implementation of that uh, burden shift has been very uh, has been varied, has been extremely varied across different courts. With um, uh, some courts uh, uh, interpreting it fairly aggressively, and others um, basically ignoring it and still requiring the plaintiffs to carry the burden of proof. So there's been um, it, it's just one of several sort of um, ongoing issues. Um, and then uh, uh, about what about the citizens? Um, uh, the grassroots organizations that I was focusing on are 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 basically among the citizens. They're they're not they're not the citizens, but they live in that area. They're not uh, you know uh, based in a university or they're not uh, based in uh, a very populated uh, or a very sort of you know elite neighborhood or sort of uh, community. They come from those areas. Of course, they're not the same thing as you know the rural villagers who do not. Uh, for example, uh, are, are illiterate or, or cannot um, uh, access the channels of either government or the courts. Um, but I think structurally they function to, uh, uh, to bridge that gap, uh, to help bridge that gap uh, between the people who are uh, the first line, the people suffering the pollution, uh, the people who live in the villages, and then helping them and then uh, get to the government or get to the um, and get to the courts. But I think that your question raises another important point, which is that in this uh, progress of public interest litigation, it cannot substitute for pollution tort litigation. It cannot substitute for people who have suffered personal harm, uh, you know, their, their crops died, or uh, half the village has cancer. Um, it's only another uh, vehicle, but it doesn't solve the problem that pollution tort cases were having a lot of difficulty getting into court before public interest litigation showed up? I, I, my short response to your question, because th that is my, my doubt, my deep doubt on, on if we only have an environment uh, public interest litigation is working, we cannot see, we cannot see the, the, the there is a rule of law in China. And Actually, this is my question. My question. I I I ask uh, um, you to answer what, <laughs> and my my I serious doubt it. Uh, I think right now, uh, environment public interest litigation became a politically a correct things to do. So the government, uh, the leader, political leadership allows uh, NGO, some NGOs, Congos, uh, to do it. But for other right protection uh, field, like the women's rights, uh, 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 criminal defense uh, case, and uh, dis disabled people's rights, you didn't see those uh, public interest litigation or we could, or Weichuan uh, right uh, protection case. Uh, you, you, you can see very harsh uh, political environment towards those uh, right protection lawyers. And the lawyers were arrested uh, last year. Many of them were arrested. So uh, as the, uh, Steve said, um, uh, we hope environment issue, environment uh, public interest litigation can uh, need the change of the uh, legal system, uh, judicial reform in China. That is our hope. The wedge. Okay, sir, just, just real quick. Yes. 
Real quick question. That should be on. Yes, it's going to be very quick, uh, dear. Thank you, uh, Jennifer. You started out. Oh, uh, who are you? So let them know who you are. It's uh, VOA, uh, Shenhua. Uh, the, uh, Jennifer, you mentioned uh, at the very beginning about uh, the uh, Chai Jing, uh, her uh, documentary film, and earlier also you mentioned her. Where is she? Uh, I want to update uh, this information about uh, her whereabouts <laughs> for my listeners and viewers. A lot of them uh, want to know where she is. Uh, well, to go further, uh, is she part of uh, Stay the, on uh, topic, sir. Gongo? Is, is she part of uh, Gongo uh, as a team? And do you have any uh, collaboration uh, between uh, you guys and uh, her and the uh, team under her? Well, the question is this. I, I understand your living space is, is going to be limited, in my understanding, in China. Uh, here you are, you represent NGO, local NGO in China, and then you are foreign international presence in China. Mm. Uh, here you are, you are here, that means Chinese government still allows you to be there. Mm. I, I don't know how long your organizations are going to be allowed to be there. That's my, uh, the, uh, you know, big question. Okay. So since you are here, you are okay now. Okay, that was used to promise. Okay, um, do you have a quick question? Okay, be honest with me and say who you are, so everyone knows. Yes, uh, Bob Heiss, uh, EPA enforcement. Uh, it's been reported that there's a certain approach or technique that's taken, like Beijing Olympics, the Guayu electronic dis dismemberment to save uh, uh, facilities, the city, where uh, polluting industry has moved out. It may not be cleaned up, it's just moved elsewhere. What is the public interest bar or the legal community, the legislative community trying to do about that? Migrating pollution away from the, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so real quick, comments on these, 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 these final two. Do you want to go, Mike? Yeah, I would like to answer your second question. I know you, what you mentioned is uh, like the uh, international NGO, the, the uh, ongoing uh, legislation on the international NGOs in China. I, I know the, um, the Minister of the Public uh, Security is drafting the law, but I didn't see the, the draft, and I, I don't think other people uh, get the, the draft. Uh, that is uh, bad, bad news because those uh, uh, NGO uh, uh, regulation, regulations are supposed to draft by uh, Minister of the Civil Affairs instead of the Minister of the Public Security. So you can see from the, uh, the minister, uh, the draft of the, the law, you, you, you can see and uh, the, the the political leadership uh, consider it as a public uh, the political issue uh, the security issue instead of for uh, of uh, in, uh, in the domestic issue so that it is uh, uh, bad news for uh, international NGOs include uh, ABA Ronnie uh, I don't know where Chai Jing is. <laughs> no, um, um, she. I understand that she did her uh, documentary independently uh, and using her own funds. Yeah. But uh, I don't know. No. But but she, but also you know we can't forget that the Chinese state media put it out there initially, and then obviously it was after and it was out there for a few days before it was silenced. But it's slowly it's back online. Just as we predicted, we had a panel. We said it's going to come back online quietly. It's online again. So, uh, so, my question is, I oh, want to see some uh, collaboration between the NGO and uh, her uh, team, if possible. I, yeah, I, I mean, I that she, yeah. Sorry. No, 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 uh, I, and, and, and she worked with the Friend of Nature and worked with Ma Jun and the work, uh, get some uh, opinion from NRDC Beijing office. Uh, so definitely yeah. she uh, was working with NGOs. But she also worked with the government. I mean, she interviewed top government officials, news media. I mean, she's, she's a very, sa she's, she's an incredibly savvy journalist, broadcaster. And so I think that she tapped all the knowledge that was out there, which included NGOs, but also I think very heavily on talking to government officials. Okay, Steve, you're going to close us. So, you know, the one question that you guys, everyone kind of hedged on. So are these legal, uh, you know, we should do like a thumbs up, thumbs down, like Facebook. So do you think that, um, you know, we, we, we've talked about the kind of shifting sands in the law and, 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 and organizations and things that are coming down the pike to improve enforcement. Do you, are you guys optimistic? Is this, are, are, we, are we going in the direction of breaking the dome? I mean, I mean, I mean, in well, some ways, institutions in waiting, maybe only Steve will answer this, right? Well, <laughs> let, me, let me at least start, because I, I do want to hear from my colleagues. And I, you know, I, in a sense, I feel like I don't have answers. I'm, I'm here to learn. Um, but 
the, I mean, the kind of hard-hitting question from the uh, our friend from VOA is, I think, uh, important to see that that's how the press operates in the United States. Um, and w one thing that impressed me about Under the Dome was, as, as I understand it, um, the, the Xi Jinping who made the film is essentially kind of a mainstream journalist in China. And here she chose to take her time and her funding, wherever, you know, whatever source it was, to spend time on this very hard hitting documentary. Um, and that, that not only did it have sort of these hundreds of millions of views online, but that, you know, IPE with their, their smartphone app that was discussed in the film, uh, the air pollution, the pollution, China pollution map app, um, had an explosion of downloads. Mm -hmm. And that illustrates that, that, you know, we may be a little bit agnostic about is the legal system really going to be um, uh, ready for all of this. But the, the social media, you, you know, you can, really can't control it. Um, and yeah, you know, they did take, you know, get the, the main websites or the easiest websites to see it on to drop it. And they were able to tamp down, the, the government censors were able to tamp down the discussion uh, in the press and online. Uh, but after hundreds of millions of views, each of the first two weekends, so it was a little bit like what we say in the U.S., closing the barn door after the horse has gotten out. The, the one other thing that um, I'll mention about Under the Dome is that she, she narrated the film from the perspective of a new mother worried about the health of her kid. And, and you know, people who know me from uh, China Environment Forum know that that's the question I ask after most sessions here is, is China ready to look at environmental problems in terms of public health and in terms of uh, the health of children? Uh, and so I think that framing of the documentary is potentially a very big step forward in China. Any final comments? You don't have to answer my last one. Just anything last to say so we don't go home crying. <laughs> So we, we, we have to uh, try our best, and even though we know there are many obstacles, uh, but uh, good things, uh, um, there are many NGOs and uh, environment lawyers are, are trying to use the uh, environment uh, protection law and other laws and uh, try to achieve the goal. Um, the goal is a uh, rule of law in China as well as uh, the environment protection, the cleaner uh, environment in China. Uh, one quick thought. I think that um, part of the reason that that documentary uh, maybe was taken down was that it spread like wildfire. Uh, and the, re the, the amount of interest, the sort of groundswell of you know, uh, extreme interest in this topic um, was maybe a bit scary. Uh, and I think that um, the role that uh, civil society organizations, NGOs are increasingly playing is a way to um, channel the energy in a productive way, exactly. uh, especially in the environmental protection area. The NGOs that are, are you know, they, they don't run into trouble or they don't have problems are the ones that have productive relationships with government uh, and the ones that um, work with productively, cooperatively with uh, agencies and with uh, policymakers, legislators, to address the problem, so that it's like um, it's it, it, it's a positive energy. It's not a sort of um, you know the kind of energy that leads to uh, to protests or things like that. So I think that that is a very important part of how this issue can continue to move forward. And I got to thank the speaker. I mean, okay, first applause for the three very eloquent speakers here. Um, I can see that there is a hunger for us to keep talking about it. Because sometimes when we say governance, people go <laughs> But not, not when we talk about environmental governance in China. You guys come out. You came with good questions. I know we didn't get to everyone's questions. Um, so I want to thank them. Thank you guys also to thank the Blue Foundation of the Blue Moon Fund that are currently supporting the China Environment Forum. And those of you who are interested in more, besides signing up for our mailing list, on Thursday we're having a meeting discussion about something that's new, new 